Please stand to your feet out of loveliness and respect for the public reading of God's word as we wrap up our series on the seven churches of Revelation, finishing the church at Laodicea. Today, we're gonna pick up where we left off. If you happen to miss last week's message, then uh, you're missing 50% of the teaching. Please jump online to watch and or listen. Revelation chapter three, beginning verse 17. For you say, I am rich, I have prospered, and I need nothing, not realizing that you are wretched, pitiable, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you to buy for me gold refined by fire so that you may be rich and white garments so that you may clothe yourself and the shame of your nakedness may not be seen and salve to anoint your eyes so that you may see. Those whom I love, I reprove and discipline. So be zealous and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and eat with him and he with me. The one who conquers, I will grant him to sit with me on the throne as I also conquered and sat down with my father on his throne. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Father, we thank you for this teaching, for the seven letters, the seven sermons that Christ preached to the seven churches. Thank you that we have ears to hear and hearts to receive what the Spirit said then and what the Holy Spirit is saying now through the Holy Scriptures. It's in the name of Jesus that we pray and all of God's people said, amen. You may be seated. Once again, the main idea from the church of Laodicea was it was a lukewarm church. It was neither cold nor hot. Jesus said, I wish you were either cold or hot. And because you're not, I'm I'm gonna spit you out of my mouth. So if the Ephesian church was the loveless church, the church of Smyrna was the persecuted church, the church of Pergamon was the worldly church, the church of Thyatira was the corrupt, tolerant church, the church of Sardis was the spiritually dead church, the church of Philadelphia was the patient church, the church of Laodicea, is known as the lukewarm church. In all of these seven letters, Christ follows the same outline. He addresses, number one, the the congregation. Number two, he congratulates them. Number three, he gives them a charge. And number four, he gives them counsel. Not advice. Advice, you could take it or leave it. He gives counsel. So we're gonna pick up where we left off. Point number three, here's the charge that Jesus gives this lukewarm church in Laodicea. For you say, I am rich, I have prospered, I need nothing. Perhaps there's not a more self-boasting, arrogant, prideful statement in all of the Bible than what was said here by the Laodiceans. Their assessment of themselves is kind of the American assessment or the assessment of the, the American church. We are rich, we have prospered, we are in need of nothing. Now, when it comes to riches, It's always agitated me, aggravated me, that there are two extremes. There are those that try to use God to get rich, and there are those that try to use God to make you poor. Both extremes are wrong. There is a biblical view of riches. When you think of riches, you need to think of a coin, just like a coin has two sides. When it comes to riches in the Bible, there are two sides. There are riches with sorrow, there are riches without sorrow. The Bible clearly condemns the loving of riches. 1 Timothy 6, 9 and 10, but people who long to be rich fall into temptation and and are trapped by many foolish and harmful desires. They are plunged into ruin and destruction. And here's why. For the love of money, not money, but the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. And some people craving, craving money have wandered from the truth or from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. You can't love riches, but in the Bible, you can live with riches. Big difference. Same coin, two sides. In Proverbs chapter 10, verse 22, let's read it out loud together. The blessings of the Lord makes a person... The blessings of the Lord makes a person what? Are, Are we reading that right? Yes, rich. And he adds no sorrow with it. So there are riches, material wealth, that can come your way that is not attached with sorrow. Many people who are rich are filled with sorrow. There are those who are rich that are rich through the blessing of the Lord and there's no sorrow attached to it. There is the leaving of riches. Paul said we came into this world with nothing, we're gonna leave this world with nothing. And Jesus said in Mark 10, 25, in fact, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. Some people teach that God's against riches and that that if you're rich, you're not gonna be able to make it to heaven. No, he's against those, and in this very chapter of Mark 10, in in the context 
the verse, there's a verse in, in Mark 10 which says, they that trust in their riches. Once again, God's not against you having money. He's against money having you. He's not against money. He's against the love of money. He's against those who live and crave and long and seek for, for money. In 2 Corinthians 8, 9, this is a scary verse. It's hard to believe it's even in the Bible. But look at what it says. You know the generous grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that by his poverty he could make you what? Rich. Now some people want to interpret that. Well, he's talking about spiritual riches, Carl. The context of this chapter, he's not just talking about spiritual riches, he's talking about material riches. So there are lawful riches. Once again, riches with sorrow, riches without sorrow. What are lawful riches? It says of Abraham in Genesis 13 2, Abraham was very rich in livestock, silver, and gold. When you study the life of Abraham, matter of fact, when you study the life of every Jew, they understood biblical economics. That's why, even though the Jews have been in exile since 60 AD until May of 1948, when they came back to the land of Israel, the Holy Land, and became a sovereign nation once again. For almost 2,000 years, they lived in exile. Here is the proof of their understanding of biblical economics. No matter where the, no matter where the Jews found themselves, all they needed was three generations. By the third generation, they were controlling the levers of power in that nation, that country, that region. Why? They understood biblical economics. They understood the principles of wealth creation. And they also understood it's not a sin to be wealthy. It is a sin, though, to love that wealth. So there are limited riches. Matthew 19, 21, Jesus told a man, if you want to be perfect, go sell all your possessions, give the money to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. Only one time did Jesus ask an individual, a rich person, to give up their wealth. This person, because he loved his wealth, trusted in his riches, was unable to obey Jesus. Now let me tell you something, friends. If Jesus, not some tele evangelist on Christian TV, but if Jesus tells you to go and sell everything you have, give it to the poor, and then come follow him, your response, my response, immediately should be, yes, Lord. Where, how, and when, right? But the only other person that this was uh, applied to was Job in the Old Testament. God blessed Job. He took all of Job's blessings from him. But Job, whether he had plenty or had nothing, he said this, the Lord gives, the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. He never falsely accused God. And at the end of Job's testing, at the end of Job's trial, God blessed him with twice as much as he had before. Once again, not God is not against you having riches. He's against riches having you. There is lordship of riches. What's the lordship of riches? That God is the Lord of all things. Look at Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 18. And you shall remember the Lord your God, for it is he who gives you power to what? Look at that. He gives you power to what? Did you know the Bible also says the wealth of the wicked is laid up for the just, and God wants to give you the wisdom, the power, and the ability to acquire wealth, not so that you could boast, look at me, I am rich, I have need of nothing, but God wants to bless you so that you could be a blessing, and if God can get it through you, God will get it to you, and you need to change the way you think because some of us, some of you were raised in a church, raised in a religion, raised in a denomination, that places a premium on poverty. Being rich or being poor is not the issue. Being righteous is the issue. And you can be righteous and poor or you can be righteous and rich. You could be God, you can be ungodly and poor or you can be ungodly and rich. It's not whether you are rich or poor, it's whether you're godly. In Matthew 6, Jesus said, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added unto you. Once again, we don't use the Bible to get rich, nor do we use the Bible to make people poor. Some people say, well, I'm against the prosperity gospel. Well, I'm kind of against that phrase, prosperity gospel, but both of those terms are biblical. Prosperity is mentioned in the Bible. 
and the gospel is mentioned in the Bible, here's what I'm against. I'm against people using God to get rich and I'm against people using God to make other people poor. The blessings of the Lord make you rich and he adds no sorrow with it. Change your thinking. Understand what the Jewish people know, we need to know. They understood three things about money. The meaning of money, the making of money, and the management of money. The reason we, you, at times have financial problems is because you don't understand the management of money, the making of money, and the meaning of money. When you understand the spiritual nature of money, Jesus deified money when he said you cannot serve both God and mammon. He, he placed a, a spiritual dimension to money. And until we understand that money is a tool, money is not the end, money is a means to an end. When we make money the end, our lives will be filled with all types of sorrow. But when we understand that money is a tool that we could use to glorify God and to help others, God wants to bless you. He, the blessing of the Lord makes someone rich and he adds no sorrow with it. Come on somebody, let's give God praise in the house of God. The problem with Laodicea was they were boasting of their own riches. They had a love for riches and a love for money and it caused them to become spiritually complacent and they were suffering from spiritual smugness. And in their boasting, which uh, unless you boast, you should only boast in the Lord, they excluded God and pride comes before a fall. And so here was their assessment of themselves. We are rich and have need of nothing. And Jesus said, no, here's what you don't realize. You are wretched, you are miserable, you are poor and you are blind and you are naked, Revelation 3:17. So here is the great physician, Dr. Jesus, diagnosing the condition of the patient. There are people walking around with a terminal illness and they don't know that they have a terminal illness because it has not yet been diagnosed, but it doesn't change the fact that you are a walking dead man or a walking dead woman. And all of us, spiritually speaking, are terminally ill because of sin. And there's only one cure, and Christ is the cure for our spiritual condition. We, outside of Christ, are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. Doesn't matter what we look like on the outside. Doesn't matter what we own or what we drive or where we live. We are hopeless without Christ. We are in need of Christ. The book of Ecclesiastes says God has placed eternity in the hearts of men. As St. Augustine said, my heart is restless until it finds its rest in thee. There is a God-shaped void in us that nothing in this world will ever fill until it's filled with Christ. That's why I want to share with you a painting, Hogarth's Bedlam. Uh, it's a painting from the 17th century, and it's interesting. It's an interesting painting. Uh, this painting from Hogarth is a scene of, of confusion and dismay. Each person in this painting shows the distress of what life is like when you simply live for yourself when you live for the carnal passions and pleasures of this world. There are three key figures in this painting. The Pope who represents religion that's without Christ. Uh, an astronomer which represents science without Christ. And a king which represents politics or all of life without Christ. And you see the distress on their faces. You see the Pope, he has a paper diadem with his cross. You see the astronomer with a paper tube devoid of lenses, not sweeping the heavens, which declare the glory of God, but the walls of this madhouse they find themselves in. And then you, say, you see the naked king with a scepter and a crown of straw. The misery is seen on their faces. They are poor, they are wretched, they are blind. They don't know their true state or their true condition. And yet, not all is lost, not all is hopeless. Even though the Laodiceans were in this very state, Christ said, I love you, I discipline you, there is hope, I want you to be zealous, and I want you to repent. I want you to understand your, your spiritual state. I want you to understand your bankruptcy without me. So he uses these very descriptive words. He says, you are wretched. Wretchedness is actually a theme in the Bible. The Apostle Paul in Romans 7, 24, he said, wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? And the very next verse, he says, thanks, thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Wretchedness is our state outside of Jesus. Everyone living in on, on planet Earth, everyone living in our country, in our city today without Jesus, they spiritually are in a state of wretchedness. 
But not only are they wretched, they're also miserable. They are miserable. Paul, the apostle in 1 Corinthians 15, 19, he said, if in this life we only have hope in Christ, we of all men are most miserable. There is a, a misery that is associated with life when we're living our life outside of Christ. Some people are just so miserable. How many of you know people like that? They are just, they're not in church with you today, but uh, they're, they're, they should be, right? You know, some of the most miserable people are, are religious people because they have a form of godliness, but they deny the power thereof. So this is Jesus' diagnosis. His, he, he gave a thorough examination of the church, and they said, we're rich, and, you know, we have need of nothing. And he says, no, 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 you're wretched, you're miserable, you're poor. Once again, the Bible never says, blessed are the poor financially. There's no place in the Bible that says that. But it does say, blessed are the poor in spirit. When you realize how destitute you are spiritually outside of Christ, that is a blessing. Because what comes next is you, can only, you then turn to Christ to find his love, grace, and forgiveness. So this church was wretched, miserable, poor, blind. They had physical sight but no vision. And they were naked. Nakedness in the Bible speaks of shame. So Christ encourages them that he wants to cover their shame uh, with, with a robe of righteousness that, righteousness that he offers. All right, so the patient is diagnosed, terminal illness, here's the cure. Jesus now finally, number four, gives them counsel. Once again, not advice, but counsel. Now, friends, if an extremely successful businessman or businesswoman like one of the wealthiest people in the world, if, the, if you had the opportunity to sit down with them and they said, okay, listen, I'm going to give you the best financial advice you will ever hear. If they were going to offer that advice, how many know we would be a fool not to listen and we would be a fool not to apply it? Well, Jesus is not offering advice. <laughs> He's offering counsel. He's offering truth, truth that sets free. So verse 18, he says, I counsel you to buy from me gold refined by fire so that you may be rich. White garments so that you may clothe yourself and the shame of your nakedness may not be seen and salve to anoint your eyes so that you may see. So he says in verse 19, those whom I love, I reprove and discipline. So be zealous and repent. So the proof of Christ's love in your life, in my life, is his reproof and his discipline. There's an old saying, it's not in the Bible, but it's based on the Bible, spare the rod, spoil the child. Anytime discipline, God's discipline of his people is mentioned, Proverbs 3, Hebrews 12, throughout the Bible, you have to understand there's a difference between discipline and punishment. The word discipline means to teach or to train. Please listen to me very clearly. God doesn't punish his children. He will punish the world of sin if they don't repent. He never punishes his children. He loves you. You are his son. You are his daughter. But because he loves you, he doesn't punish you. He disciplines you. And there is a big difference between the punishment of God or the wrath of God and the discipline of God. Because he loves us, he disciplines us. Now, I've always wondered, and I know, and I know, and I think it's been years, I don't even think I've ever taught this to you before. Maybe you've heard it elsewhere. But the question is, and it's a good question, it's a legitimate question, how does God discipline us? Some religions teach that when you're sick, you get in a severe car accident, you total your car, and you go through bankruptcy, and you're lying in a hospital, God is punishing you for your sins. That, that is so non-biblical, it's not even funny. And yet many people blame God for things that happen to them that God is not a, a party to. So it's an important question. How does God discipline us? Several ways, and they're all biblical. First of all, he, to discipline means to teach or train. He disciplines us through his word. Look at 2 Timothy 3.16. And I know I'm going through a lot today, right? Because uh, this is really, I'm giving you three sermons in one. You're getting your money's worth today. So all of this is in the notes. Go to the website, go to the, 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 download the Trinity app. You can get these notes. We do have a few hard copies at Trinity Central at the end of service, okay? I want you to have this information. So all scriptures breathed by God for profit, for teaching, reproof, correction, training, and righteousness. 
So number one, God disciplines us through his word, through a a prophet's prophetic uh, word to us, through the preaching of the Bible, the teaching of the Bible, or the reading of the Bible. God uses his word to correct us. Number two, he uses his Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit comes to convict the world of sin, righteousness, and of judgment. When you and I grieve the Holy Spirit or quench the Holy Spirit, terms that are used in the Bible to describe our relationship with the Holy Spirit, we sense the grieving or the quenching of the Holy Spirit, we feel the conviction of the Holy Spirit, this is the second way in which God disciplines us. The third way, and this is uh, an exception, but there are severe cases when in a church, the leadership of the church has to excommunicate a member. These are rare moments, but in 1 Corinthians 5, there's a guy in the church at Corinth 2,000 years ago that was committing a grievous sin that's, that's detailed there in 1 Corinthians 5. To such an extent, Paul said, basically, he has to be excommunicated and because he was not repentful. And you're to turn him over to Satan. Look at the verse, 1 Corinthians 5, 5. You're to turn him over to Satan for the destruction of the flesh so that his spirit at the end may hopefully be saved. So on at least, I think, three occasions, we've, we've had to meet with people in this church and say, listen, you're in, you're in grievous sin, and you're not repentful, and you're not changing your ways. We have to ask you to leave. Now, we love you. We pray for your soul. But because they're hard-hearted and non-repentful, they, they have, because a little leaven leavens the whole lump. So this is, this is another level, an extreme level. And there's an extreme case here described in the church of Corinth. So how does God discipline us? Through his word, his spirit, the church, holding us accountable, but also through his, through his people. Look at Galatians 6.1. Brothers, if anyone is caught in any transgression, you who are spiritual should condemn and judge a person. Is that what it says? No, no, no. I'm sorry. I, I'm, reading, I'm reading out of the wrong Bible. Brothers, if anyone is caught in any transgression, you which are spiritual should what? Restore. Restore. In a spirit of legalism? In what? What kind of a spirit? Thank you. And then keep watching yourself lest you also be tempted. So, I am my brother's keeper. You are your brother's keeper. You see somebody actively, openly involved in, in defiance of, of the teaching of Scripture and in living in sin. You're t- in, in a loving way, not in a condemning, guilt-inducing, shame-inducing way, but in a loving way. You're saying, hey, bro, man, what you're doing is not right. You know, you know what the Bible says. I, I know, I know. I want to pray for you. I want to help you, man. Let's, let's go get some help. Let's, let's work through this. Let's pray through this. Come on. You know, th- this, this road, is, it's going to lead to destruction. We are our brother's keeper. And finally, how does God discipline us? Through his imposed consequences. For every sin, it has its own consequence. It's not from God or the devil necessarily. It's just the consequence of that sin. Colossians 3.25, for he who does wrong will receive consequence consequences for the wrong which he has done and that without partiality scripture says in Galatians 6 uh, 7, 8, and 9 be not to see whatsoever a man sows that shall he reap so if you don't like the harvest you're getting you need to change the seeds that you are sowing because there is a law of sowing and reaping All right, that's how Jesus disciplines us because he loves us he wants what's best for us so he says be zealous and repent. And then he says, once again, back to verse 18, he says, I counsel you to buy from me gold. Now, how many of you own gold? I know you may not, you may be uncomfortable to raise your hand. Only about 2% in all of our services, like three or four people in every service raise their hand. Jesus said, buy from me gold. Now, Abraham, the Bible says, was rich in three areas, fixed assets, land, cattle, and precious metals. So once again, the Jewish people understand biblical economics. It's wise to diversify your investments, land, fixed assets, cattle, or precious metals. Um, So Jesus says, buy from me gold. This is kind of funny because 30 years ago, I felt the Lord said, buy gold, Carl. But I didn't have any money to buy gold, so I didn't buy gold. 20 years ago, the Lord said, Carl, buy some gold. And I didn't buy any gold. 10 years ago, he said, Carl, buy some gold. I didn't buy any. Five years ago, he said, buy some gold. I didn't buy any gold. Then I found out Costco was was selling gold. And the Lord said, go to Costco and buy some gold. And I said, I don't trust their gold. (laughs) No, I'm just kidding. (laughs) Bottom line is, I've always delayed in buying gold. Not 
we don't own any gold. Just some jewelry, wedding bands, right? <laughs> That's not the kind of gold, though, that Jesus is talking about. Nothing wrong with it. Might be wise to invest, once again, in these fixed assets. But Jesus said, buy from me gold, refined by fire, so that you may be rich. This is spiritual riches. So what does gold represent in the Bible? Gold is a uh, very valuable, precious commodity, right? So in the Bible, gold represents three things. It represents God and all of his excellency and gloriousness. It represents the deity, the, the Holy Trinity, gold does. It represents the gospel and the most excellent message for all the world. It represents the Christian graces of love and joy and peace and forgiveness. Buy from me this gold, Jesus said. Not fool's gold. The, the world uh, offers you fool's gold, right? It's called pyrite. It's this shiny yellow mineral consisting of iron, but it's not, it looks like gold, but it's not gold. So much that looks like God or looks like the gospel or, or looks like Christian graces is not, and we need to know the difference because we're to buy it. That's an interesting term. Jesus said, come buy from me gold that's been refined in fire. Buy, how? What does it mean to buy? What if we don't have any money? To buy means to own. That there are some things in, in, the, in, in this life that you cannot borrow from others. You need to possess it yourself. You need to buy the gold of, the, of, of, a, of a relationship with Christ, of the gospel and the grace of Christianity. You need it yourself. I love the way Isaiah, 2,700 years ago, I love the way I, the Isaiah put it. He said this, Isaiah 55, one and two, Let's, let's say that first word together. Ho! Come on, say it together. Ho! Isaiah was the first rapper. Did you know that? <laughs> Ho! <laughs> Everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. And you who have no money, come buy. Buy and eat. Yeah, come buy wine and milk without money and without price. Why do you spend money for what is not bread and your wages for what does not satisfy? Hogarth's Bedlam painting, Laodicea, and your wages on what does not satisfy. Listen carefully to me. Eat what is good and let your soul delight itself in abundance. And then it ends with this most famous verse, verse 20, behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I'll come to him and eat with him and, and he with me. This is the most important knock you will ever hear. My wife and I were in Albuquerque this past Sunday evening, Monday, Tuesday for senior pastor's round table. We stayed at a hotel right off of I-25 and we're checking out Tuesday morning and it's 1045, you're supposed to check out at 11, so we had 15 minutes and uh, our door was shut, locked, and I had the do not disturb sign on there. But still, housekeeping, housekeeping. I'm like, what is she knocking on my door for? It says do not disturb, I got 15 more minutes, right? And then she used her master key, like Pastor Stacy was talking, and she opened the door. My fault, I didn't double lock it. Thank God we were both dressed, amen. I'm like, whoa, whoa, we're still in here. She goes, oh, sorry, yeah, sorry, shut the door, right? Sometimes we put the do not disturb sign out for Christ. Now, this, this, this is, okay, Revelation was written 95 AD, 60 years after the resurrection of Jesus. These are seven important sermons that Jesus is preaching 60 years after his resurrection to these seven churches. So when he says, knock, I'm knocking on the door of your heart and I want you to open it. He's referring to a parable he had taught 60 years earlier. In Luke chapter 12, verse 35 through 37, he says this, here's the parable. Let your waist be girded and your lamps burning and you, you yourselves be like men who wait for their master when he will return from the wedding, that when he comes and knocks, that they may open to him immediately. Blessed are those servants whom the master, when he comes, will find watching. And then this is mind boggling. Listen, look, watch this. Assuredly, I say to you that he, the master, Jesus, will gird himself and have them sit down to eat and he will come and serve them. Are you kidding me? So Jesus is knocking. He wants, to, because your heart has a door on it, the door of your heart. He's knocking and he wants to come into your, your heart as a home with many rooms. He wants to come into your heart, come into your life, and then he wants, he wants you to sit down. He'll go to the kitchen, prepare, put on the apron, prepare a meal for you and come serve you. 
that's what's being said here. <laughs> Wait a minute, this is introverted. This is, this is not, this is up is down, down is up. No, 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 no. Jesus, you come into my life, you sit at my table, I put the apron on, and I come and serve you. He says, no, but first I want to come and serve you. That's how much he loves you. He is obsessed and crazy about you and me. This verse is so beautiful. It could be a sermon all by itself. It speaks of the friendship of God. He wants to come into your life to have sup, King James, have fellowship with you, break bread with you. It speaks of friendship. Abraham was known as a friend of God. God wants you to be his friend. But here's what this verse says. It says that we have a home, our heart's like a home, it has a door, and we can shut it to whomever we want to shut it to or open it to whomever we want to open it to. And so many times we open up the door of our heart to all kinds of strangers who are living inside of our heart and we leave Christ outside of our heart. So Christ stands outside of our hearts wanting to get in. He deliberately is denied entrance. He's excluded in favor of other guests. Nevertheless, he wishes to enter and he also recognizes our freedom to allow him in. So he says, I stand at the door and knock. And if you hear my voice and you, only you, open the door, I will come into your life and I will have fellowship with you and you will have fellowship with me. The question, the big question is, friend, do you hear him knocking? Have you already heard his knock and have you personally already opened up the door of your heart and have allowed Christ to come into your life? And you know what? The church of Laodicea, of these seven churches, Jesus is the head of the church. And of these seven churches, the final church mentioned here in Revelation, the seventh church, Laodicea, where do we find Jesus? On the outside of his church, knocking, trying to get in. Christ deserves the best seat in our house, the best seat in our life. And the very fact that he's knocking it's a loving knock. It's a personal knock. It's an earnest knock. It's a persistent knock. Christ will continue to knock until his knuckles are bloody because he wants to be in relationship with you. And then he ends. You think, you think, well, there, you can't surprise me anymore with how much you love me and how much you want good for my life. He ends in verse 21 by saying, the one who conquers, I will grant him to sit with me on my throne. Yeah, all of you, just make it to the end because here's what I have in store for you, all of you that conquer. Just like I conquered and I sit on a throne with my father, because you're going to conquer, you're going to sit on a throne with me. A throne is another important thing throughout in all of Scripture, God's throne. But thrones are a theme throughout the book of Revelation. They're mentioned dozens of times, even in the, in these, in the seven churches. A throne is a symbol of power and authority. And Jesus is saying, here's what I have in store for you if you'll conquer. Can you even see yourself seated on a throne with Christ? I know, it's hard to imagine. Why would he want you? Why would he want me seated with him on a throne? I don't have the answer for that. When you get to heaven, ask him. His answer will probably be something like this because I'm crazy about you. I love you, and I've always wanted to be in relationship with you. Let's give God praise in the house of God. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Father, today we want to be zealous to repent. We want to turn from our own ways and turn to you wholeheartedly. We want to trust not in the things of this world, but in you. We want to look to you, the author and the finisher of our faith. So if there's anything in our life that's unpleasing to you, Lord, we want to be quick to repent now in Jesus' name. We turn to you and we open up the door of our heart. We say, Christ, come in. Have fellowship with us. For our hearts are restless until they find their rest in thee. With heads bowed and eyes closed, if you're here today and you don't know Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, or you need to rededicate your life to Christ, I'm going to lead you in a prayer. If you'll say it with your own mouth and mean it from your own heart, that's opening the door of your heart and allowing Christ to come in. Here we go. Dear God in heaven, I know I'm a sinner in need of a Savior. There's only one Savior. His name is Jesus. I call upon you, Jesus. I ask you now, 
Come into my heart. Come into my life. Be my Lord and be my Savior. I turn from sin to the true and living God. I receive his love, his grace, and his forgiveness. Dear God in heaven, you're now my father, and I am your child. Fill me now with your Holy Spirit and give me strength to live for you and serve you all the days of my life, beginning today for the rest of eternity. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's give God praise. Can we do that?